All right, that's 10.15, folks, so you are officially latecomers now. No pressure. <laughs> Come on, have a seat, there's still space. So I'll just forget these folks exist and just begin without them. They can just catch up. The Absolute Basics, my name is Paul Hudson. This talk is called Understanding the Standard Library. If you don't know what I do, I run this site called Hacking with Swift, where there's something like 1,200 articles online about Swift, all free of charge. In January, I launched a video course called Swift in 60 Seconds, teaching the fundamentals of Swift in videos that are one minute or less, lightning fast. In August, I released a new open source app called Unwrap, helping you learn iOS and Swift coding right on your phone. And just last month, with my friend Sean Allen, I released a podcast, like everyone else in the world. It's called Swift Over Coffee, and it's brilliant. Go and subscribe, and then tell your friends. But my main job, of course, is writing books about Swift, like Hacking with Swift, or TVOS, or Swift Design Patterns, or Vapor Books, and so forth. I'm up to 16 books now, and everyone here, go to that URL. You can get a copy of ProSwift completely free. It includes six hours of videos. Uh, all my books have free lifetime Swift updates. So if you are uh, hanging around a few weeks, you'll get updates 4.2. Uh, there for like five more seconds. Four, three, too slow. If you want to get in touch, please do. I am two straws on Twitter. I am two straws on GitHub. On Reddit, I'm two straws. But on Stack Overflow, I am two straws. Uh, so remember the first part, I'm pretty easy to find. Or email me, I am paul at hackingwithswift.com. OK. so. Today's plan, uh, I'm speaking at 17 events this year, and every time I go and speak somewhere, I do a completely new talk every time, which means I can tailor my talks for the individual audience. So I thought to myself, OK, MobyConf, what's MobyConf famous for? And the answer is having very experienced senior developers coming along who want to learn something new about Swift. So I thought, OK, fine, let's, let's up my Swift game slightly. Where can I find really good Swift code and talk about really good Swift code? And it hit me. Swift itself. We can go to the Swift standard library and look at how it works. And I actually use it all the time when I teach. I use it a lot because I want to show folks it's not magic. It's not special. It's the same kind of code you write. And in fact, if you look behind the scenes, vast amounts of Swift is written in Swift. Sure, over half is the compiler. That's C++. But a whopping 42% of Swift is Swift. That's a standard library plus tests and more. Then there's a bit of Python and then some other stuff, like a bit of C++ and similar stuff. Now, I could do a whole talk on the 52%, but I suspect no one would like that very much. Uh, so instead, I'm going to talk about the Swift used inside Swift. Because I think it's some of the most efficient, performant, optimized, reusable code you will ever find. It's extraordinary quality Swift code. And it's extremely composable. They make advanced functionality out of hardly any code by putting pieces together. I like to think of Swift as being uh, beautifully fractal. The closer you look, the more you appreciate it. Look even closer, you learn even more and even more, and just keep on looking closer and closer and closer. There's more things to discover. So today, we're looking at lots of Swift code straight from the standard library. Literally pulling it apart, seeing how it works, seeing why it works that way. But I'm not going to simplify the code. I'll literally pull out from GitHub the source code in front of you and walk through the real code. There's no dumbing down here. And we're not doing this for fun, just for kicks. 
And we're certainly not doing this so you can go back to your desk in a few days and tell your colleagues how clever you are with these new keywords you learned. Instead, I want you to go back and apply these techniques to your own code. Look at the way they've solved problems and say, I can do the same thing. So that your code will be faster Swift, safer Swift, and smarter Swift. And in the time we have, there's a nice timer right in front of me here, I'm going to cover only six things, so be prepared for lots of code. And with that, I'm going to switch to my desktop. Uh, and here, you can by all means follow along. This is github.com uh, slash apple slash swift. And we can go ahead and go to the clone or download button here, press the clipboard to get to the clipboard, launch a terminal. And we're going to go ahead and clone the Swift source code. Uh, so in here, I'll do CD desktop, then uh, git clone and paste that URL and hit return. Uh, it'll download all the Swift source code, plus its history, straight from GitHub to my desktop. Thanks to the uh, lightning fast push internet, it's done already almost. Thinking about it. Boom. So we now have all of Swift on my desktop ready to work with. Obviously, I don't want the compiler, I just want the standard library. So I'm going to go into the Swift directory, then stdlib, then public, then core, and open that in Finder. Boom. So this is the Swift standard library all written in Swift. Uh, and you'll see it's auto code apart from this one here. There's one uh, here and one there that end in GYB. This is not really pure Swift code, this is a generate your boilerplate file. Uh, some files like floating points or arrays, they're very, very similar, like floats and doubles, for example. Basically the same properties, basically the same methods, different storage. So rather than duplicate the code again and again and again, they just write the Swift code once, wrap it in Python a little bit to duplicate the compile time, and call it a boilerplate file instead. So ignore the GYB files. For now, we're going to scroll upwards to find uh, bool.swift. This is where uh, Booleans are implemented in Swift. The entire structure and all its functionality lives in here somewhere. So inside here, we're going to search for func ampersand ampersand, and this is our first code sample. Boom. So let's uh, yoink out that code, make it nice and big so you can see what's going on. So as you can see, the function signature is three lines long, right? It's a long signature, but the actual body is just one line of code. And it manages to be one line of code by cramming in lots of cool functionality. For example, we have operator overloading happening here. We have auto closures. We have try catch. We have the ternary operator. And we have the rethrows keyword. And these things all combine to give us just one line of code to implement this entire operator. Now, this thing, logical and, is used a lot in Swift. We're familiar with code like this. Let A equals false. Let B equals true. If A and B print both are true. But we know as developers that because A is false, it doesn't matter what B is. It'll never check B. It does condition short circuiting for efficiency purposes. So the left hand side is our bool, some sort of Boolean value, true or false, ultimately. The right hand side are auto closure throws returns bool. And that's where you start cramming in the functionality. You can see this auto-closure thing here. That's useful because you might try and run some sort of slow function in here. You might say, uh, if A is true, then run some very slow, uh, important code. But of course, if A is false, you don't want to run that slow, boring code. And so the auto-closure kicks in and effectively wraps it inside a closure so it can only call that code when it's really required. And the whole thing is marked as throwing that parameter, because we're able to say if A and try B. Try doing B, and if it works, great. But that throws keyword doesn't mean must throw. It means might throw. And so we can also say if A and B. Could throw, could not throw. And that's where this rethrows keyword comes in. And that's the first thing I want to look at in this code. Rethrows is an extraordinarily important keyword, and you see it all the time in Swift. And what it means is, if my parameter throws, consider the whole thing a throwing function. Otherwise, consider me a non-throwing function. And it's used in so many times in Swift, over 200 times. This is the nil coalescing operator, you know, again, the exact source code straight from Swift. You can see on the left-hand side an optional T, 
The right hand side is the default value to use if the optional is nil. Again, it's auto closure throws. The code will say, look at the optional. If it has a value, unwrap and return it. Otherwise, try running the default value. And again, there's our friend rethrows. So, back to my desktop again. Uh, let's have a look in a playground, blank, and then uh, desktop's fine. Make it a bit bigger. There we go. And scrap line three. Okay. So we're going to look at an example of rethrows in real code. You've seen how Swift uses it. Very cool. We'll look at how we use it in our own code. We'll imagine an operation where the uh, system has to fetch some data, maybe remotely, maybe locally. The remote thing might throw. In our case, it will throw for testing purposes. But the local thing, well, you know, your phone's always there. That'll always succeed. So we'll start by making an enum to represent our exception. So we'll say enum failure error. The first case will be a bad network. So some sort of message comes back saying, you know, the firewalls block the port, whatever. So we'll do uh, case bad network message string. And the second case will be uh, it's just you know, broken because it's just a case at this point. So we'll do uh, generic it's just broken, then end the enum. So that's the possible errors we can throw. And now we'll write a fetch remote method, which will attempt to fetch some remote data. It's going to fail for testing purposes, and try and return a string. So we can say uh, func fetch remote throws returns a string. Then do some complex nut code here, then throw the error saying the firewall screwed it up, and end that. So that's our fetch remote function. It's always going to throw. In theory, it returns a string, but it's always going to throw. Now I'll add a fetch local function, which will always succeed because it's, it's locally stored. But it still has to return a string. So I'm going to say uh, func fetch local doesn't throw return string. This will always work. And then return tailor and the function. So a remote function returns a string, throws. A local function returns a string, doesn't throw. Now we'll write a third function that combines those two. Let us call one of those two things and prints out what it got back. So we can say func fetch user data takes a closure that throws and returns a string, and then itself throws. Inside that, we'll try calling the closure. So we'll say user data equals try the closure, then print out what we got back, and end the function. Boom. Three functions, two of which throw. Now let's try using fetch user data. So we're going to say uh, do Try fetch user data using fetch local. Catch, uh, there's an error with the network, then grab the message and print it out. Like this, print message, not that, and then end the catch, and then print, otherwise there's a fetch error, and end that. Brilliant. OK, so it's saying back, it received user data correctly, which is fine. So it's working correctly. But we know, we can look at this code and see that fetch local never throws. It can't throw. As a result, fetch user data can never throw. It's impossible. But we still have to have do, try, and catch, because we've marked it as throw, so Swift's warning us we have to use this stuff. And that's where the rethrows keyword comes in. If I go up to this throws keyword and change it to be uh, rethrows, I'm now telling Swift this only throws if the closure it's passed throws. So on the code, Xcode should say, come on, Xcode, boom. No calls to throwy. The throwing functions occur within try expression. It can now look at the code more clearly and see fetch local doesn't throw, therefore fetch user data never throws. It's able to understand more about our code. But if we had, had instead used fetch remote, so let's replace that with fetch remote, and then press play again, uh, it should now require do try and catch. So what we're doing is we are giving Swift significantly more information about our code. So it can look through it and understand what's going on. And in exchange, it'll do far more work for us so we can get back to doing what's important, aka arguing on Twitter. I'm going to put that thing into the uh, smarter box. Let's move onwards. Back to my code again. Uh, let's scrap that playground. Don't need that anymore. Don't need bullet Swift anymore. So here in Finder again, I'm going to scroll up, 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 up to find, boom, assert.swift, my all-time favorite file in Swift. Uh, it contains my all-time favorite function, which is assert itself, which is just down here. 
There it is. Assertions. Love it. Use assertions, please. But this time, we're going to go further, 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 further to find a precondition. My second favorite Swift function. Again, let's isolate that code, uh, make it sense from the screen so you can see what's going on. Uh, if you haven't looked at this before, it's doing a bit of work here. It's saying, if we are in debug cert configuration, i.e. you've pushed from Xcode directly, then check the condition. If it returns false, trigger an assertion failure, printing the message, printing the file name, printing the line number, and so forth. But if you are in release configuration, i.e. you've shipped code to the App Store for real users, it will still check your condition, but now it will trap if it's wrong. It'll do a hard crash which means in debug mode, you get a nice soft crash. In release mode, you get a hard crash. Either way, it'll crash your code, which might sound really bad. But if we go back to the Swift code again, if I go back to uh, my terminal window, there we go, I can look through here to try and find out how many times Swift itself uses precondition. I can use grep to search for it. So if I run the command uh, grep precondition and then open parens, and then star and hit return, we will see uh, unsafe raw buffer pointer, Unicode scalar, substring, string variant, string storage, string gut, set variant. It's used all over the place. If I run that command again and append to the end uh, wc-l, it will tell you how many times Swift uses precondition. And the answer is 256 times. That's how many times Swift will unconditionally crash your app when you screw things up. So they think this is perfectly normal. You know, trying to do things like call remove last on an empty sequence, that's a mistake on your behalf, crash the code, making a reverse range a mistake. Integer division by zero, or reading out of array ranges, all of these things are logic errors, all of these things should crash. So, let's go back to our code again, and I'm going to make another playground. Here, Command Shift N, enter next. Uh, yes, create, yes, replace. Uh -huh. Make it a bigger, track line three. So let's look at an example how we can use precondition in our own code. If you have an array of integers tracking uh, scores in an exam, and you want to return back the average of those scores, you might write something like this. Uh, func average of scores and int array returns a double. Then we can use reduce, let sum equals score reduce zero plus, and then return the double of that sum divided by the double of scores count, and end the function. So that's how we might calculate an array. We can now say, here's my scores, 100, 80, 8, 90, and then average those with average of those scores and print out the result. Boom, 90. Of course it is. That's the average of those numbers. It makes sense. But what if we try to provide invalid data here? We've tried to send this an empty array of values. Let's find out. So rather than an array of scores, I'm going to say here is an open and close brackets. Boom. And press play. And now what we get, if I zoom in on the right, is a nan, a not a number. So Swift can't catch that for you. Swift won't throw errors on that. You can't debug that very easily. You'll have this hideous NAN value polluting your code wherever you go, causing very weird bugs, probably in layout. It's a bad idea. What you really mean to do is say, calling this average of scores function must be done with at least one score. And that's where precondition comes in. We can add a line to the top saying, Precondition, scores.count is greater than zero. You must provide at least one score. And now if I run the code again, it should cause a crash. Boom. So it's telling us straight up front, this is a bad idea, you're using it wrong, please don't do that. Which is much more helpful. So let's get rid of that again and look back at the source code again. Because there's something else here I want to talk about, another useful thing Swift's doing in this code. And in this case, it's this part here, a static string. Let's bring that up nice and close. This is a string type, a special string type, that is only for text known at compile time. Nothing with string interpolation will be classified as a static string. Which means if you said, Stuart one's hello Dave, that's fine, that's a static string. 
but str2 equals hello name with string interpolation, that's not a static string. It can't be no compile time. You cannot use that. And this is super helpful for any types that are stringly typed, like URLs or images or colors and so forth. Because these use strings by default, which is not very pleasant. We can wrap those with static strings. For example, here is an initializer for UI image called bundle name. And it wraps UI image named. But you'll see here, I have a force unwrap. I feel comfortable having that in there because of static string. Either I have typed it correctly or I have not. I can't meaningfully catch that in code and show a useful error message to users. It's better to say, you must hand type this. So let's look at this in action. Uh, oh, I may have closed that playground again. Whoops. Okay. New playground. Uh, next. Yes. Desktop. Yes. Yes. Replace. I should probably use these things. Uh, make that nice and big here. And then scrap down to line three. You should know you can make regular expressions by saying something like let regex one equals try ns regular expression pattern some pattern. And um, az at means it will match uh, bat cat. Sat, mat, you know, all the AT words, right? But making a regular expression is a throwing initializer. This might fail. At the same time, I can look at my code and say, I have, I have literally hand typed that regex. If I've got it wrong, I don't want to add some do catch around this. It makes no sense. I've hand typed it. It's definitely correct. So you might be forgiven to saying, I'm going to use here an exclamation mark and say try exclamation mark. And, you know, if that works for you, fine. But an alternative is to use static string. We could say, make an extension to NS regular expression with a convenience initializer that adds a static string. And inside there, we know that the pattern we have is guaranteed to be correct. So we can go ahead and say, uh, a do block, uh, try initializing with that pattern, then catch and use precondition failure cause an immediate crash, saying, you've screwed up here, please try again, end the do, uh, end the initializer, end the extension. So I feel comfortable having a crash here, because you should not get this wrong. It's either right or it's wrong. It's a programmer error, a logic error if you screw it up. And now we can use that to say, uh, let regex2 equals ns regular expression with my pattern. No more try, no more catch required. It's going to work because it has to be hand typed. And again, static string has to be hand typed. You can't use string interpolation here. It's a much, much cleaner way of working. So while I agree there are many times to use force unwraps, you know, try exclamation mark there is probably OK. It does pull your code a little bit, like reasons to get out of there. But you've seen how precondition does mean you can crash your code earlier and give meaningful feedback to other developers and how static string, where required, eliminates string interpolation to make your code safer. And both of those two things I'm going to put into the safer column, while at the same time acknowledging they do mean you can do less work, because you're asking Swift to figure these things out for you. OK, let's move onwards. Halfway, we're almost there, don't worry. Let's uh, look at uh, a function you should all know already. Um, so here's an array of strings, apple, kiwi, peach. You should know if I pass that through the map method and use $0 uppercase, I will get back at apple, kiwi, peach, and uppercase. But if you were like, at your desk thinking, how would I personally code the map method, how would you do it? What would you use? Let's take a look. I'm going to reuse the playground this time, because I'm getting smarter slowly. So up here, let's scrap this code like that. Uh, so you'd start by saying, you know, this is an extension on sequences, right? Of course it is, because you want to extend sequences. And in there, you want to have a, a my map method that's generic over t, because it, it does some sort of transformation to a t. We don't know what t is, of course. So I'll say uh, public func my map generic over t. Uh, this, of course, has a transformation closer, takes an element from the array or the sequence, transforms it, and returns a t. Uh, so I'm going to say in here, uh, we'll do, come on, next code, transform element throws return to t. Uh, and then the whole my map method will throw and return an array of t, the transformed items you've got. So I'll end the method, then do it array throws returns array of t. Great. Inside that, you might start by saying, here's my result array. So I'll do uh, var result equals an array of t and then loop over all the items in self and transform it and append to the array. So we can write 
uh, four item in self, result.append, try transforming item, end the loop, end the method, oh, return the result, of course, don't forget that, return the result, uh, end the method, and end the sequence. Boom. That's how you and I might implement a map method. And that kind of works, it's not bad. Let's look at how the Swift standard library implements it. Well, the one thing they'd change, of course, is they wouldn't use throws for mind map. You've now learned this is a great place to go up here and change throws to be rethrows, so that map only throws if the transformation closure these throws. You've learned something already. Love it. So uh, let's go back to the command line, and I'm going to open up uh, open sequence. I think sequence.swift. Boom. There we go. Okay. Let's bring up that file. Uh, I'm going to look in here uh, for the map method. So command f func map. Boom, there it is. Let's scroll down a little bit. Cool, great. OK. So there is the Swift implementation of map. Again, let's isolate it a little bit, make it a little bit larger. I could do a whole talk just on this one method and how they've implemented it, because it's full of interesting uh, techniques. Um, but here, there are just two things I have time to pull out. The first is its use of contiguous array. So Swift has three kinds of arrays, uh, one of which is your generic run-of-the-mill array, which is the default for all our arrays. You know, when you say int in square brackets, you get a Swift array. And this is a really helpful type if you need to bounce between NS array and Swift arrays very commonly. In fact, it's optimized specifically for that purpose. There's also array slices, which you get, of course, you slice an array like 0 through 5. Uh, these are designed really for short-term usage because they have very serious memory implications. You know, if, you, if you take a small slice of a huge array, you can't toss that huge array away. That small slice keeps the huge array in memory until the small slice has gone away. So you have to be careful with that. The third type is contiguous array. This is the fastest of the three types. And in fact, the Swift devs describe it as giving you C-like performance. It's fast. So if you haven't got a bounce between NS array and Swift arrays regularly, or you aren't calling objective C APIs with your array, then you will find contiguous array is the best choice, particularly if you're using classes. It's faster for structs too, but particularly for classes. However, I consider contiguous array an implementation detail. Do not put that into your API. Don't try and return contiguous arrays. Instead, do what Apple do. They create them inside the method, perform all their computation inside the method, then convert it back to a regular Swift array in the return type. It doesn't pollute things too much. But there's more. Look at this line of code here. Reserve capacity, initial capacity. This is a really, really helpful method to use um, because it means you, you avoid constantly adding to your array when you use append. You know, with append, you have an item like this and you add to it, Swift will double the array size and then double it again and double it again and double it again. And each time it has to double the array, it has to copy those items somewhere else. So there's a cost to appending when you run out of room. With reserve capacity, you can say ahead of time exactly how much space you need. Map knows how many items it needs, because it's a one-to-one -one transform from the source array. And the cost is order n. So if your array is empty, which it was with map, it's lightning fast. But you will be careful, because there are downsides to reserve capacity. You have to ask yourself, is your array growth strategy better than Swift's? Swift uses geometric growth, which means you have an array of two items and add to it and it'll have double to four and then eight, then capacity eight and then 16 and 32 and, and 64, 128 and so forth. It doubles it every time it runs out of space. So is your strategy better than that? Let's look at an anti-example. Ah, rats, I may have closed the playground. Uh, yes, whoops, OK, let's make a new playground. Uh, yes, that's, that's fine. Yes, replace that playground. Uh, make it nice and big. And delete that line of code. Fine. Let's do an example of where you can go wrong with reserve capacity, because this is important as where you can go right. So let's say you are uh, superstitious people. You play the lottery. You might want to track an array of your lucky numbers you want to play with. So I'll have an array here of all my lucky numbers and int array. 
And now I want to have a function that gives me my week's lucky numbers. What are the 10 numbers that are totally, definitely guaranteed to win the lottery this week? Uh, so we might write something like this. Uh, let's do uh, func pick lucky numbers. And every time this function is called, I'll take my array of lucky numbers, get its size, add 10 to it, and reserve that as my new capacity. So I can say in here, let size equals all lucky numbers dot count plus 10, then all lucky numbers reserve capacity size. Boom. And now I can make my new 10 lucky numbers using the new 4.2 randomness API, which I love, by the way. I can say uh, for underscore in 1 through 10, all lucky numbers dot append, int dot random in 0 through 50, end the loop, end the function. Okay. So each time that function is called, it'll expand all lucky numbers by 10, add 10 numbers to it. But, you know, lucky numbers are lucky, right? They're good forever. And they're so lucky, in fact, I can go ahead and calculate a year of lucky numbers up front ahead of time. So I'm going to say below that, uh, 4 underscore in 1 through 52, pick lucky numbers, and end the loop. Boom. Give me a year of these things up front. Let's look at this code. I've explained that reserve capacity is ON. And of course, this loop through 1 to 52, that's also ON. And if you combine those two together, you of course get ON squared. And if you're asking yourself, what is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's quadratic. Uh, you may be thinking, is that a good idea? Of course. No, it's not a good idea. We don't want quadratic functions in our code. Uh, and actually, you've made something that's worse than Swift. Just using append would have been faster than doing reserve capacity in that case. See, if you have an array of items like this, let's say it holds two, and its capacity is two. So if I want to add another thing to that, we have an order n. It will resize the array to hold four items, and then add our third one. But the fourth addition, that's a one, because there's space already. I can just slot it right in there. So it's holding four, capacity four. The next append, fine, that's another on, so it'll double to eight. It'll add the item, but the fifth one, 01. The sixth one, 01, and so forth. The rest of them are all 01, until it doubles again, in which case, again, it's on, but now has even more room. And what happens is, the 01s ultimately massively outnumber the ons. This amortizes down to a single 01, versus what we had with our on squared. So you've got to be really, really careful with this functionality. It can make your code much faster, but it can make your code much slower as well. So that's contiguous array, and that's reserve capacity. Both of these are awesome. Both of those are going to put squarely into the faster box. Let's march onwards with some more Swift 4.2. I love Swift 4.2. Uh, here's an array of numbers, 10, 20, 30. If I want to verify these are all double-digit numbers, I could use a new all satisfy method of sequences. I could say let all double digits equals numbers dot all satisfy dollar zeros greater than nine. It'll go through each one, check that closure, return true for the whole thing. But again, how would we implement all satisfy? If you're coding ourselves, what would it look like? Back to my desktop again. Yes, I've got a playground pre-made. Cool, let's delete all this code, boom. Again, it's an extension on sequence, because you need to start with that, because it's sequence is modifying, so we'll do uh, extension sequence. Uh, then we'll have all satisfy. This time, there's a predicate closure. It takes an element, might throw, returns boolean, did it pass my predicate or not? So I'll say there is a predicate closure, takes an element, can throw, returns a boolean. And the whole all satisfy method will return a boolean and rethrow, of course, because it doesn't throw if the closure doesn't throw. So we can say rethrows returns bool. Uh, inside here, we can start looping over the items. Did this thing pass the closure and so forth? So we can write as our first line of code uh, for item in self. Then, if try the predicate returned false, if it failed the test, we can go ahead and return false immediately for the whole method, end the condition, end the loop. But at this point, after the loop, if it's gone through all the items and they all pass the test, we can safely say uh, return true. Then end the method, then end the extension. That's how I think you and I might implement all satisfy. Let's have a look how the Swift team do it. 
so back in the terminal again, uh, this time the file we're looking for is called um, sequencealgorithms.swift. So let's open up that one. Boom. Uh, and again, command F, funk, or that's it. There we go. Boom. OK. So there is our code. Let's make it a bit bigger. Boom. So again, it was three line signature, but one line in the body. The actual implementation is trivial. It does, however, have this not predicate and a not contains. You have this double negative thing going on, so it's rather hard to understand at first. But when you break it down, it's actually quite beautiful. The predicate, of course, is designed to return true if each item passes the closure you specify. Is it over 9, for example? So we flip that around to say return true if it fails the test. Then there's this form of the contains method, which returns true as soon as any item returns true for its closure. And again, that is flipped around. Return false as soon as any item returns true for its closure. So the whole thing will return false as soon as any item fails the test. They're composing code beautifully, just like I said to you. Swift is extraordinarily composable. So uh, da -da -da -da, let's go ahead and scrap that, and let's use the playground again. Let's look at how we can use the same contains where method to compose functionality of our own. Now, you should know that uh, if you have an array of strings, like uh, I always use Taylor Swift examples, sorry, um, like her albums, uh, so if we had uh, let albums equals uh, red, fearless, and reputation, we can say print albums.contains reputation. And of course, the answer is true. We're saying, this, does this thing contain the string reputation? It does, right? And of course, strings have a contains method as well. If we had a phrase saying, let phrase equals my favorite album equals uh, reputation, I can print out phrase.contains reputation. And that's true too. We, we kind of get this, right? So there's two individual contains methods. But the contains where method is different. That lets us combine things together by passing a function or a closure to apply to each element in the array. So now we can say, does this phrase contain any item from the array? By saying, let contains any equals albums.contains where phrase.contains, and print out contains any. And it will now say, uh, does that phrase contain red? No. Does it contain fearless? No. Does it contain reputation? Yes. And as soon as it finds one that is true, it returns immediately. It's extraordinarily powerful. So you can build more advanced functionality by combining code together. But why stop there? Swift lets us compose and combine functions even more deeply than that. And to demonstrate this, we're going to do a little bit of source code archaeology. Uh, we're going to roll back to an earlier version of Swift where they were a little bit more uh, loosey-goosey with their experimental code. So uh, back in my desktop again. Uh, I'm going to switch to my terminal window. And I'll run the git tag command, which means show me all the tags in Swift. And you can see here we have daily snapshots every day for the whole year, then 4.2, 4.1, 4.0, go way back, 3.1. Let's go back to, I mean, here's fine. Let's choose 302 release. I'll copy that to my clipboard and then scroll down and paste that in to the terminal with git checkout paste. And that's telling Swift, please roll my version of Swift back to an earlier time when Swift was truly Wild West, Swift 3. And we can now look at how the source code's different. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and navigate up a directory, and then uh, one more, and look at this function here. This exists in the Swift experimentals directory in your source code. And it, it's a bit intense, I agree, when you first see it, but it's quite beautiful. Let's make it nice and big. So it's generic over three things, T, U, and V, which alone makes some people's head hurt. But what's happening here is it's given a closure called F that takes a T and returns a U. That's all F is doing as a function. 
And a second function called g, that is generic over a u, takes a u and returns a v. And the whole thing takes a t, or it returns a function that takes a t and returns a v. So it kind of acts as a pipe. It puts together the f and g functions. One takes a t, returns a u. One takes that u, returns a v. So it combines it all into one function that takes a t and returns a v, which is neat. And I want to use this outside of you know, Swift Experimental and so forth. But to use it, I like to make two small changes, uh, partly because the mathematical function composition operator isn't very helpful to coders. So I'll change that to be uh, three angle brackets or three pulp fiction brackets if you're that sort of way inclined. But also, and this will make the uh, mathematicians in the room cringe slightly, I prefer to swap f and g. Uh, gf is mathematically correct, fg is just simpler for coding, quite frankly. So we're going to try and use this in some actual code. Uh, so there's Swift's own code. I'm going to go back to my playground again. Where did it go? There we go. Okay, fine. Let's go up to here and yoink out that code. Uh, we're going to add that as a uh, custom operator, which in Swift means first declaring a precedence group. So we can go ahead and say uh, precedence group, composition precedence, associates to the left. So if we use it more than once, it will combine the things to the left rather than to the right. And then declare our custom operator. So we can say uh, our infix operator, triple angle brackets, is a composition precedence. Infix meaning its operands come to the left and right of it. And now we can paste in that long uh, chunk of Swift, which was uh, public func, triple angle brackets, TUV, takes as its first parameter some sort of F that's escaping, takes a T, returns a U. Second parameter is G, it's escaping closure, takes a U, returns a V. And the whole thing returns a function, it takes a T, returns a V, and inside that, we'll combine them with a closure. So return gf at zero and end the function. So that lets us compose things together mathematically, or because I've switched f and g programmatically. So now we can start to define functions. What functions might this use? So I'm going to start by saying, uh, let's generate a random number between zero and some maximum. So I can say, func generate random number, maximum int returns int. And inside that, I'll just use uh, Pick a number, so let number equals int.random in, zero through max, print out that I'm using it, then end the function. Boom. So it takes an int, returns an int. The next function will take that returned int and calculate all the factors of it, which numbers divide equally into that. So we'll say, func, calculate factors, number is an int, returns an int array, of course. Uh, making factors in, in Swift, of course, is just a one-liner. Uh, we can say return one through that number filter, number percent zero is zero, and the function. So that returns an int array. So the first one takes an int, returns an int. Second one takes an int, returns an int array. The third one will accept that int array and reduce it to a string, saying here are the factors. So we'll say func reduce to string, numbers int array returns a string. And then inside that, we'll use uh, reduce. We'll write return numbers.reduce, factors are, then $0 plus string $1 plus an empty string, end the reduce, and end the function. Takes a string, uh, takes an integer, returns an integer. Takes an integer, returns an int array. Takes an int array, returns a string. These things form a natural chain. And that's where our composition operator comes in. We can now say, make a new function called combined that does generate a number, and then does calculate factors, and then does reduce to string. And that's now a new function that accepts an integer and returns a string. So I can call that by saying print combined input 100. And boom, in the corner here, if I zoom up slightly, there we go. So it's made the number 60 randomly, it's calculated the factors being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, 15, 20, 30, and 60. By combining it, it's going to return a new function. Absolutely beautiful. So that contains where. That's going to go into the smarter functionality and also how you can compose things at an even more deeper level than that. Uh, I've got this big timer in front of me saying I have one minute 45 left. I have to talk about this all day, quite frankly. Grab me afterwards. I'd love to talk more about Swift. In the meantime, let's wrap up. I encourage you, 
Go to GitHub, snag Swift. It's open source. It's some of the finest Swift code you will ever see. Go and dig through it. See what things you can find. We looked at just six things today. Contains where, contiguous array, precondition, reserve capacity, rethrows, and static string. But I promise you, this thing is an absolute gold mine of functionality. You will learn things every day just by seeing how they solve stuff. I promise you, you will be impressed by their code. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? You can find me afterwards. Excuse me, just a quick one. Uh, in the last example with the combined function, if you would like to use like preconditions inside the function, how it will the compiler allow us to see the errors in a clear